Good morning, folks. That's a good way to start the service, isn't it? We are excited to have uh, the colleges uplift with us this morning. Uh, Caleb and Sam are on that team. This is the same group that Bree has been a part of in the past as well. And uh, it's just good to hear some, hear some music and uh, hear their voices. Uh, we're just going to, just so you know, the, the offering is going to happen in just a little bit. But we're going to cover some quick announcements here. And I uh, wanted to let you know, just right off the cuff, um, when we take that offering, if you would like to give in order to support uh, Uplift, um, just mark it in some way, mark the check or uh, mark it uh, on an envelope uh, when the offering comes by, put that in the same offering. We won't take a special offering later. Well, we will, except it's for the deacon fund, but uh, communion at the end of the service. But wanted to let you know we're not going to take three offerings this morning, just two, all right? Uh, this morning, we did have our Bible studies, the impact. Uh, we do have communion in the morning uh, service as well. Tonight, 6 o'clock, is our evening Bible study. It's going to be our house tonight, and so come and we'll enjoy some time in the scriptures here uh, this evening as well. This Wednesday, Young at Heart in the morning, and then uh, youth group is at night. Uh, a week and a half, I had to think about it, a week and a half is Adventure Club is going to be starting off. And so just to give, make you aware of that once again, we're looking forward to that. Um, speaking of, just real quick, uh, those of you workers that are involved in Adventure Club, we will have a meeting, and, and I'm thinking we really need to have a meeting probably next Sunday. And so heads up on that. We'll send you messages, we'll, we'll give you phone calls, alert you in an effort to get everybody together. Uh, the, the other thing we just need to make mention of is Saturday, it's this Saturday, right? I'm looking for Pastor Nolan. Is Faith Fest, is that right? Is it next Saturday? It's this Saturday, yeah, okay. Th this coming Saturday is Faith Fest uh, for the teens, and so just be aware of that. Um, uh, if you have questions in regard to that, you can talk to Pastor Nolan. I think that's all of the announcements we really need to hit on. I just point your attention to our weekly devotional as well from uh, Romans 8.25. But why don't we just begin this morning with a word of prayer, and then we're going to turn it right back over to Uplift. Father, we're so thankful that we have this chance to be together as a church family. We're grateful that uh, this morning our family has grown just a little bit. We rejoice in the camaraderie that we're able to have, all because of Christ. And we pray that both in spoken word, as Caleb opens the scriptures up with us in just a little bit, also in song, that it would be the name of Christ that is magnified. Christ, it's lifted on high. We pray that uh, uh, while we listen to the songs, uh, we know that uh, there are voices and it's fun to hear their voices. Uh, the, the scriptures are, are clear that we can lift our voices to you. But Father, this is not about a group. It's not about... Uh, magnifying or glorifying man. It's about uh, honoring uh, the, uh, Christ in the place that he deserves, the, the place that he belongs, which is on the throne, both literally in heaven, but also on the throne of our hearts. And so may Christ occupy our hearts and minds as we go throughout uh, this morning. Uh, Father, also we pray that uh, uh, you would challenge our hearts. Uh, we know that... Uh, um, we, we desire to keep Christ as forefront to our thoughts, but we also, Lord, know that uh, ourselves can be exhorted toward holy living. And so I pray that that would also happen both in song and spoken word this morning also. Father, we thank you for this. Uh, glorify yourself, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. We are thankful to be here this morning. We are the Uplift team from Faith Baptist Bible College. And so for a few minutes, I'd just like to tell you a bit about the college. Um, most of you are likely familiar with it as both of your pastors are graduates of faith. Um, we've had other students attend faith. And we're really excited about what God is doing on campus. Uh, Uplift just had a fun time interacting with some of the teens in Sunday school. Really encouraging time. Uh, fun to catch some of their questions as well and to even hear from Pastor Nolan on his reflecting on his experience at faith. 
we are excited that Faith is actually educating 37% more students this year. That's a lot of growth. We've, it's been fun to see chapel more full um, with extra rows of chairs added with the new incoming students. Um, and we have 25% more students on campus this fall, which is really expected, really great growth, and we expect more in the future. And thankfully, we, we have room for them. And this is our highest enrollment in 20 years. So we're excited to see that God is working. He's drawing people to spend a part of their lives investing in good Bible teaching to equip them to serve churches like yours better, um, even to go and take the word to the world, which is kind of the school motto. And so we're excited to see what God is doing there. We have new additions to some of our programs like early childhood education. We have an apologetics emphasis now. And we even have opportunities for high school juniors and seniors to take classes for just $99 in 2024 online. We've also seen campus just, um, we've seen some improvements there. Uh, Faith has spent $5 million in upgrading the campus, um, fixing some problems, making, we've added a lot of uh, trees and brush and um, other flowers to make the campus very nice and presentable. It's really a beautiful campus, and we're thankful for it. Um, as you heard from Pastor, we do have Faith Fest this weekend, and I know a few teens are coming to that, so we're really excited. It's a great time when hundreds of students from around the Midwest and probably further come to Faith. They enjoy games together. There is evangelistic preaching. It's really an exciting time. I know many of the kids uh, enjoy that, and I think many come to Faith because of their interactions that they have at Faith Fest. Um, my name is Seth Elliott, by the way. I should, probably should introduce myself. We are really glad to be here. Um, it's an encouragement to travel around the Midwest to different churches to encourage you to strengthen your faith, and we're, we always come away probably more encouraged than, than we, more, with more encouragement than what we gave to you, and it really is a blessing uh, to interact with you and um, to see your love for one another. Um, at this point, we are going to switch to our congregational singing. So we're going to sing, O Church Arise. So would you stand and sing as we worship this morning? <laughs> Church, arise and put your armor on. Hear the call of Christ our captain. For now the weak can say that they are strong in the strength that God has given. With shield of faith and belt of truth, we'll stand against the devil's lies. An army bold whose battle cry is love out to those in darkness. Our call to war, to love the captive soul, but to rage against the captor. And with the sword that makes the wounded whole, we will fight with faith and valor. When faced with trials on every side, we know the outcome is set. Christ will have the prize for which he died, an inheritance of nations. Come see the cross where love and mercy meet, as the Son of God is stricken. Then see his foes lie crushed beneath his feet, for the conqueror has risen. And as the stone is rolled away, and Christ emerges from the grave, this victory march continues till the day, every eye and heart shall see him. So spirit come, put strength in every stride, give grace for every hurdle, that we may run. of a fervent, good, and faithful. As saints of old still line the way, retelling triumphs of his grace, we hear their calls and hunger for the day 
when with Christ we stand in glory. Amen. You may be seated. At this point, we're going to have uh, our offering. Our offering will be at this time.
Good morning, everyone. My name is Lexi LaFleur. I am a native Iowan. I'm from Bondurant. Um, when I was six years old, I was exposed to the gospel. I grew up in a Christian home, Christ-centered, Bible-believing. I was very blessed to have that upbringing. Um, so I, I heard the gospel, and I realized my need for a Savior. And when I was six years old, I placed my faith in Christ. I don't exactly remember all the details surrounding it, but I remember knowing that I was a sinner and knowing that Christ came to die for me and that he was buried and rose again to give me eternal life someday. And so as I was growing up, I was in the church. Um, I was actually growing up around faith because my dad was a professor there. So I was used to the college. I always just assumed I would go there. Um, and then when I was about 11 or 12, a trial in the family just really uh, tested my faith and I hardened my heart against the Lord. And for years I just struggled with sin I struggled with um, not trusting God and not thinking that he really cared. And that really pushed me away from faith. Um, so then when I was 18, the Lord just, uh, he broke me. He broke my heart. He broke my will. And he restored my relationship with him. So then a year after I graduated high school, I took a gap year. And then the Lord just led me back to faith. And um, I really, he grew in me a heart for ministry and a heart for the word and going to faith, I saw that that was a huge focus there and that it was somewhere where I would grow in that and where I would be encouraged in that. And now I am a senior in the music program and the four years that I've been here so far has just been, I've seen God do so much in my own life and in the lives of so many people. And it's just so cool to see God at work. And I'm really thankful for the school and for the emphasis on ministry that they have um, and just the heart for others and the heart for serving God, and I'm thankful to be here today with this group and just to see God at work here in this church. Um, we would all love to talk to you if you have questions about faith or just to talk about what God is doing. Thank you for having us. Would you stand again for our next congregational song? We're going to sing I Surrender All, and then we'll have Uplift come do one more song before the message. I surrender all. 
seated. And next we'll have Uplift sing, Still My Soul Be Still.
Good morning. How's everybody doing today? That's good. That's good. Um, we're glad to be here. I'm so happy to be able to be, be a part of this team and to be able to encourage churches. And uh, I hope that you are all encouraged today. And uh, it, I hope that this is just a blessing. Um, it's a blessing for us to have this ministry and use it to encourage these churches, and it's especially a blessing for me today because this is my church, and uh, I'm just very happy to be here. Um, please turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. We'll be in verses 3 through 8 today, um, and this passage is going to tell us what God's design for ministry is. So today, you have the opportunity to be ministered to by our team and uh, in this passage, we're going to see how ministry works in the church. When it comes to ministry, everybody has an opinion of what the perfect program is, whether it's uh, in regard to children's ministry, how you do music, or how you do your Bible studies. But we're going to look at this passage, and it's going to tell us what God's perfect pl program is for ministry. So if you turn with me to Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 8, we'll see that God's program for ministry is to use uniquely gifted individuals serving each other according to their ability. Let's read the passage. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members— and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, in proportion to our faith. If service, in our serving. The one who teaches, in his teaching. The one who exhorts, in his exhortation. The one who contributes, in generosity. The one who leads with zeal, and the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness." Let's pray before we begin. Lord, I thank you for this day you've given us. I thank you for the opportunity for the Uplift team to be here. Uh, I thank you for the ministry that you're doing here at Grace Tabernacle Baptist Church in Centerville, Iowa. Lord, I thank you for our pastors. I thank you for the ministry that you've been doing. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to use this church, that you would continue to build this church, and that you would uh, help us all to be members, individuals, united in one body and that we would seek to serve one another and to ultimately serve you through that. God, I pray you to open our eyes to this text today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So let's look back at our passage. Going back to verse 3, Paul begins by saying, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you. Paul starts off showing his authority. He says, by the grace given to me. Now we know this grace is referring to the grace from God. He explains that later. He is establishing his authority. So Paul isn't coming with any suggestion from himself. He's not coming just to, you know, give his opinion. But Paul is here to preach from God by God's authority. So keep that in mind. Now who is he preaching to? For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you. Now that word everyone, it refers to everyone. Now, that's pretty straightforward. I, I like the word everyone because it's kind of got both a plurality and a singularity inside of it. It's like every, referring to a multitude, but then it's got one, referring to the individual. It's just the perfect word to fit in this passage because Paul is going to show further how we're all individuals that are a part of the one body. So everyone. Now, uh, he, everyone among you. 
Now, who is the you? This is the, in the book of Romans. If you don't know what that is, it's a, a, an epistle. It's a letter that was written to the church that was in Rome. So Paul is writing this letter to a local church in a local city to every individual in that city, or in that, in that church, forming this one body, this church. Sounds a little bit familiar. We are here in a local city, in a local church, and I'm here teaching to every one of you as a body, individuals as part of one. So that's who he's talking to. He's talking to the church in Rome, and here I am delivering this message from Scripture that God has given to us, given to me, to preach to you. So his audience was Rome. My audience and God's audience today is you. So to everyone among you, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think. And then later he says, but to think. He's got two contrary commands here. You're supposed to think and not think? How are you supposed to think and not think at the same time? That hurts my brain just trying to think about that. So he's going to tell us how to think. He's not telling us to think as in think or not think, but he's telling us how we should think. So what is, how does he qualify this? First, how should we not think? He says, I urge you not to think of himself. I would urge everyone not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. What does that mean? Thinking of yourself highly. I think you probably already know. If I mention somebody who, if I describe to you a person who thinks too high of himself, you probably either have a person in mind or a very clear picture of somebody. Everybody has interacted with someone at some point in their lives who thinks of themselves too highly. Somebody who is always thinking of themselves first, never thinking of anybody else. Somebody who wants their way. Somebody who is not willing to listen to anybody else's way. We all know what that person looks like, and he's t admonishing us. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Well, that begs a question. How should I, how am I, ought, how do I ought to think? Like, he, not, I shouldn't think too high, but how am I supposed to think? Well, he answers that question. He says, I urge you not to think of each, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment. Sober judgment, that word, thinking with sober judgment, is just one word in the Greek. And so is the word where he says earlier, think of himself highly. Both of those words are just one word, and they're actually the same word with different prefixes. So the first one, thinking of yourself highly, it comes from basically a preposition to the beginning of the word think. So the preposition is above or high. So don't think high. And then the second one is, has a preposition that essentially means to think prudently, to like actually work it out. Now, in English, we have different uses of the word think. So sometimes I say, well, I think maybe we should go to Pizza Hut, or I think maybe we should go to McDonald's, or you know what, I don't think you should do this ministry that way, or I, I think that uh, this is the best way to do things. Well, using the word that way is just revealing a belief or a faith. That's not the way Paul is using the word here. The way Paul is using the word when he's referring to sober judgment, the way we should think, he's referring to processing something. So we also have the way of using that word in, in uh, English. So if I am thinking, I'm processing. I'm not simply having an opinion, but I'm also processing. So Paul is asking us here, he's commanding us here, to not think of yourself, not think of yourself as too high, but instead to think sober-minded, to think logically, to think realistically. Now, what is realistic? He answers that question too. Each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Now, there is a couple things that we need to see here in this phrase. So, what is he talking about? Each according to the measure of faith. I'll be honest, when I came to this part, I was a little bit confused because he just uses really general terms. He says, a, a measure of faith. What that means is just an amount of faith. Some faith. According to the amount of faith that God has assigned. And what does he mean by faith here? How is he using that? But if you look further down in the passage, which we're going to do, you see what he's referring to is to what God has assigned for you to do. What God has assigned for you to do in the church. What God has assigned for you to do to help others, to be a minister to others. So you should think of yourself in light of where God has you and what God has for you to do. 
So first off, we're not supposed to think of ourselves too high, but we are supposed to think of ourselves with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. So God is the one who assigns our faith. Now this is kind of an aside, you could take this a little too far, but the most important thing to get from that is that you should think of yourself in the light of the fact that even your faith is from God. Your faith is from God. Your position in church, your, pos- your position to be a part of the body is from God. So God is assigning you a responsibility. This whole passage is leading toward a goal. He's, he's building this argument, starting at, don't think of yourself too high. Think humbly. Think sober-minded. Think where you're supposed to be. And then he leads that down the direction of how you're supposed to serve. So think of yourself in regard to how you should use your gifts for the body. That is what Paul is urging us to do. Now let's look again at verses 4 and 5. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. This comes back to that principle of both plurality and individuality. There's both the aspect of the many, but many individuals that are making one. And it's, it's, a, it's a very beautiful picture, the picture of the body. Bodies have individual parts that do specific things, but they're all united in one purpose, and that one purpose is doing what the, the owner of the body wants it to do. And it's, that's a beautiful picture of how the church is supposed to work. There's both the individual in the body, and then there's the body, the one, the one body. Now, each of those members can't sustain themselves individually. Paul talks about that in other passages, actually, using the same analogy. But they're, they don't have any uh, perfect function apart from the body. Their perfect function is meant to be together with the body. So, for as in one body, we have many members— Each of us is unique. Uniqueness in the body's members means uniqueness in those members' function. So how is this supposed to look practically? Got to take a step step back into where we are. What What does this mean and how does it apply for us? Well, it means that people are created differently. Not all of us is the same. If you look at any other person in this room, you're not the same. There's different genders, there's different occupations, there's, uh, there's different backgrounds, there's different ages. We're all different, but God has perfectly equipped each of us according to the measure of faith, as we saw in verse 3. He's equipped each of us to have a function. Each of us have a function. Now, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but I'm going to ask you, what is your function? What is your function how has God equipped you? What are you able to do that somebody else might not be able to do? Or what are you able to do that you can fill a hole where there is one? So, this is uh, the, this analogy of thinking of the body of Christ the, uh, and members of that body. That analogy is actually where we get the term church membership. Many of you are members of this church. And we get that term membership literally from the Bible. It's not just simply like membership in the sense of like you have a YMCA membership or a golf club or a a country club membership. It's not that kind of membership. It literally is saying membership in regard to unity with the body. That's what the Bible means when it's referring to this. It's referring to membership of the body. So uh, this uniqueness of the body's members means uniqueness in the body's function in the individual's functions within the body. One thing, one consistency we see between all these verses is in verse 3 he says, uh, he says, by the grace given to me, that's from God. He says, by the measure of faith that God has assigned, that's from God. And then we're going to look down at this next verse, verse 6. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us from God, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Each of these individuals that he's mentioning, the 
uh, those who have prophecy, those who have uh, service, those who have teaching, those who have exhortation, and so on. All of these people have individual functions within the body because they have been equipped according to the measure of faith, according to the grace assigned. They've been equipped by God to do something. So, what does this passage mean for you today? I think the big picture, the big thing that we need to get from this passage is don't dismember the body. Saying that word dismembered and using that in the context of the body, that's just a gross term. I think of like, uh, I think of war movies. I think of uh, like the Civil War back when they had to cut off, amputate limbs for every little thing. Like that's, it's, it's disgusting. That's the picture that he uses here. He uses the picture of a body to show the importance of that unity. It's disgusting. It's sad. It's, it's, it's a terrible tragedy when parts of the body are cut off. And that's why he uses this analogy, because the body is important. The, body, the unity within the body is important. So how, how are you supposed to go about that? He gives us three commands here. We already looked at all of them. The first one was to, uh, think, uh, to not think of yourself too highly. So are you thinking of yourself too highly? Are you thinking, you know, churches, uh, I'm coming here to be served and this is about me. And you may not be saying that outright in your head, but you are treating it that way in how you act. Or maybe you think that you're the most important member of the body. The service that you do, I serve so much to this church. I give so much to this church. I devote so much time to this church. So I should be treated better. Maybe that's your temptation. Or maybe, uh, maybe you have some other way that you're thinking of yourself too highly. First off, you need to stop doing that. That is the first command he gives. Stop thinking of yourself too highly. Now, you can't just simply stop thinking. You have to be replacing it with something else. So how are you supposed to think? You're supposed to think of yourself sober-minded, sober judgment. That sober judgment is according to what your function is. Think of yourself in regard to how God has equipped you. So I have three questions here that will help you to uh, analyze what your function is in the body. First, how do you serve? How do you serve? You may be serving in the church already. You may be serving in lots of ways. So how do you serve? Second, how can you serve? Like, how has God equipped you to serve? How would you be able to serve? And then after you've asked those questions, ask how should you serve? Maybe you're already serving in too many ways and you need to step back because you're actually taking too much of the responsibility that other members of the body should be taking. Or perhaps you're on the other end. Maybe you're not feeling your responsibility. You're not feeling, feeling the function that God has given to you. So think, how do you serve? How am I serving now? And should I take a step back or should I step into more? How can I serve? How am I equipped to serve? If you're serving too much, you might need to take a step back. If you're serving too little, you need to step up and serve. It's the way that God has designed it and you're dismembered part of the body if you're not. And it's just, it's terrible. And ask, after asking those two questions, ask how should you serve? And do that by prayer. And some just like specific uh, applications for this. Like, you're a member of the body who has a specific function, and so only critique others' service with scripture, not your opinion. Don't think according to what you think everything else should be. Just think in regard to sober, so, sober judgment What is your position? What is your responsibility? Think on how you can serve, and don't put yourself too highly. Think soberly, and then use the gift, the grace that God has assigned. Let's pray today before we start communion. Dear Lord, thank you for this day you've given us. Thank you for an opportunity to worship you. God, we thank you for the music. We thank you for the reminder of who you are. Lord, we thank you for this truth from your scripture that tells us the importance of how your plan for ministry works. Lord, we know that your plan for ministry, your program for ministry, is so much better than anything we could come up with. We could have any number of plans. We could have any number of anything, Lord, but it would never meet up to your standard of having uniquely gifted individuals serving each other according to their ability. Lord, I pray that you would help us to each identify how we are serving identify how we should be serving, Lord, 
I pray that you would humble those who need humble, make them low, bring them lower, help them to think, help them to think practically, help them to think with sober judgment. Think, you know, what is my responsibility in the church? I'm not more important than others, but Lord, help them to think that way. Lord, I pray that you would humble us all and that you would continue to build your church with your perfect program. God, I thank you for your word. I pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you, Caleb. Thank you, Uplift. It's been a, a joy to hear you all this morning. Uh, I'm going to ask the deacons to go ahead and assemble. We are going to take communion this morning. As we look toward our time around the Lord's table, it's good to just stop and acknowledge what communion is. It is a commemoration a celebration of the accomplishments of Christ. As we gather together around the table, we pass out, and uh, you folks know this, but this is a good reminder, we take bread and juice. We don't do this in order to obtain salvation. We do it to remember this is what Jesus did for us. And so one of the instructions that Paul gives in 1 Corinthians 11 is to let a man examine himself. What he does here is he's talking about the, the difficulties that are in the Corinthian church. One of them is that they had taken the communion table, uh, the Lord's Supper, and turned it into a feast. They are going through Fellowship Hall, heaping uh, all the food on their plates, sitting down and porking out. And by the time at the end, apparently they weren't good Baptist church because when they got to the end, they were running out of food. All right? And so Paul rebukes them. He says, hey, if you're hungry, eat at home. Don't eat when you come to church. So he says, to, in order to give them the instruction about the Lord's Supper, he says, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now we know that. We read that passage frequently. Every time, in fact, when we partake of communion. But the next words are the important part, the part that I want you to catch this morning. Therefore, he says, and this was the challenge to the Corinthians, therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. So let a man examine himself. And in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks... Uh, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many are among, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. Now, the passage goes on, and, uh, and, and the context is important, but for the sake of time, let's just kind of try to make the point simple. Paul's challenge to the Corinthians is to take the Lord's Supper seriously. Once again, we don't do it for salvation, so the question comes back to, why do we do it? It's to celebrate. It's to remember, and though as, as per Paul's instructions, Jesus told, do this in remembrance of me. So the question is this morning, number one, do you know Christ as Savior? You can't celebrate something. You can't remember something if you haven't claimed Christ as your salvation. The scriptures are clear how we are to be saved. It says uh, many times over, belief and repentance are vital uh, components of salvation. Specifically, though, to pull right from the text, Galatians or uh, Ephesians chapter uh, two, verses eight and nine says, "For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves; it's a gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast." You see, it's the grace of God that reaches down and plucks a sinner from eternal damnation. 
And so we pause and give thanks. Amen? And I would say that that should be something of a daily event. Maybe even more than just daily, right? We're celebrating what Christ has accomplished for us. But furthermore, once we're saved, now we've got this, this new relationship. And so there's this examining, not just to see whether you're in the faith, but this examining, is there sin in my life that has gone unconfessed? I need to make sure that in my celebration, in my remembrance, there's nothing that exists between myself and my Savior. And so we use this time to do some self-examination. And we're going to do that here for just a moment. We're going to take some time and uh, uh, turn to the Lord uh, just personally, individually, quiet prayer. And I would encourage you to use this time to make sure there's no sin that has gone unconfessed. Uh, and, uh, and maybe the, the, the contemplation is, well, well I don't, do I need to ask forgiveness even after I'm saved? Well, you know what? The truth is, 1 John 1, 9 is written to believers. If we take our relationship with the Lord rightly, we're going to view our sin, and we know that we still sin, we're going to view that sin in the way that God views it. And there should be some hatred towards sin. And maybe even a sense of, really, I mean, this is true, there needs to be a growing sense of hatred in regard to our sin. Not just a loving God more, but a hating of sin more, a despising of that sin, the very thing that put Christ on the cross. And so, this is why Paul writes, let a man examine himself. So let's do that just now as a... a, a, a point here before we dig into the Lord's Supper. Let's take just a few moments and do a little soul searching, if we will. Use this time in prayer uh, to really search out and see if there's anything that is keeping us uh, away from our uh, steady relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we're so thankful that you've given us this this chance to remember the accomplishments of Christ. The truth is, Lord, that your mercies are everlasting, your grace is sustaining, and your love is without condition. Father, as sinners, there ought to be some sense of marvel at the fact that you have chosen to love us while we were yet sinners. And we know just by the, by the way that the word love is defined in the scriptures that it's not some uh, emotion, it's not some uh, feeling that you conjure up, but Father, your love is seen in that it is demonstrated. And so this morning we stop Uh, um, among the routine of life, we stop and we give thanks for the accomplishments of Christ. The greatest demonstration of all that Christ laid down his life for us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for such a salvation that you have provided in Christ. I pray, Lord, Uh, that if there are those here today uh, that have no thought beyond their eternal destination, they've never contemplated when this life ends where their destination will be. Father, the most important thing for them is to, to understand the answer to that question lies in your Son, Jesus Christ. I pray that you'd remove blinders off of their eyes 
pull back the veil and allow them to see the truth that your word reveals. God, for us who have placed our trust in the Lord and Savior Christ Jesus, I pray that you would give us a desire to uh, show love back because you have first loved us. And Father, love, once again, is always best seen in, in that it is demonstrated. And so, Father, help us to walk in loving obedience. Father, thank you once again for these truths. May Christ be lifted up on high in our hearts and minds this morning. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask the men to come. We, uh, as we partake of communion and we begin uh, handing out, uh, dispersing the, the bread and the juice, um, just a, a quick thought here that uh, these gentlemen are not communion police in regard to communion. Uh, they don't uh, determine whether or not you take the bread or juice. That's up to you. We do think that there are a couple important standards that are set before we partake of communion. Number one, that you're saved. You know when this, when this life ends, you're going to spend an eternity with God in heaven. And secondly, you're walking in obedience. And that obedience, we also believe, includes baptism. And so if those don't, uh, those don't uh, land on you, um, you know, it's up to you to pass the plate, but uh, let's remember that this is what it's about. It's, it's remembering what Jesus has done for us, whether we're partaking of the elements or not. Paul says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. On the night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread. David, would you pray, thanking God for the, shed, or for the, for the broken body of Christ on our behalf. Father, we just thank you for your son that was given for us. We know that you have a hatred for sin, and we just think about even Paul with his struggle. Uh, he said, the, uh, the sin I do, I do not want to do. But Lord, your sacrifice was complete for us, and you've taken our sin and thrown it as far as the east and as far as the west and you do not count it against us and we thank you for your sacrifice and for your body that was broken for us for it's in his name we pray amen As they hand out the bread and the juice this morning, I'm going to be reading from Hebrews 10. You can use this time to pray, uh, or you can use this time to listen to the truth of Scripture. Hebrews 10 reads, For the law, since it is only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, they would not have ceased to be offered because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have, need, have had consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, sacrifice and offering you have not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sins, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. After saying above, sacrifices and offerings and whole offerings and sacrifices for sin you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, which are not offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this, we will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. 
But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting for that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us, for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws upon their hearts, and on their mind I will write them. He then says, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. We'll continue in that passage in just a moment. Back in 1 Corinthians 11, again Paul says that in the night in which he, Jesus, was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner also he took the cup. Caleb, would you pray? thanking God for the shed blood of Christ on our behalf. Dear Lord, thank you for this uh, blood that you've given, that you shed on the cross for our sin. Lord, we thank you that there is power in your blood to give us propitiation for sin. Lord, your blood was the perfect sacrifice that covered, that covers our sin, Lord. When you look at us, you see not our sin, but you see what Christ did. You see Christ's righteousness, which is now ours. Lord, we thank you for that gift. Lord, we pray that you would uh, continually convict us of sin, and continually uh, bring us to you in confession of it. Lord, I thank you for your blood. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Continuing in Hebrews 10, verse 19. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, in our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another. Should be reminiscent of our study that Caleb just took us through in Romans 12. How to consider to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. For if we go on sinning willfully and receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses, how much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But remember the former days when after being enlightened you endured a great conflict of sufferings, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, and partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. While we take the offering, I'm going to continue reading this after we finish this.
Back in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul finishes his thought here in regard to the cup. In the same manner also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And all God's people say, amen. Amen. We're going to use this uh, time to take an offering. Uh, This is the deacon fund offering. We use this to help those who might be in need of uh, financial assistance. If God would lay it on your heart to give, do that now. While they do this, I'm going to continue in this passage and just finish out the chapter in Hebrews chapter 10 before we close. But remember the former days when after being enlightened you endured a great conflict of sufferings partly by being made a public spectacle through the, through the reproaches and tribulations and partly becoming sharers with those who were so treated. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. You'll love that promise, right? Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. For yet in every little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my, sh- my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. God bless the reading of his word. If your heart's been blessed this morning, say amen. Would you stand with me and let's be dismissed with a word of prayer. And while we pray, I'm going to invite the Uplift team to make your way back to uh, the foyer. Uh, You can be back there to greet one another. I encourage you to stop by their stand um, as you go and greet them on your way. Let's pray. Father, once again, we, we come to you in humility, knowing the great accomplishments of Christ. We can settle on the truth of the work that you have established in him. And Father, again, as we prayed from the beginning, uh, we pray that, uh, that the name of Christ would be lifted high, that Jesus would be on display and not man. And that applies to more than just uh, the service today in the music and in the speaking of the word, but Father, even in our actions, our conversations uh, with with uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, but beyond that even, Lord, uh, to the world that is around. God, give us zeal, give us fervor to spread that good news of salvation. Give us confidence in the midst of trials and difficulties. And Father, give us love amongst one another. uh, As Caleb uh, spoke of this morning, we know this is the purpose of the body. While there are many parts There is one body, and the head is Christ, and we glory in him. Father, uh, thank you once again for this day. Uh, Use it to further the work of your, uh, your gospel ministry. Help us to redeem the time, as the scriptures say. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.